Yo, this is the final ever AS revision video for economics. It's on supply side policy and it's part of economics AS level unit 2 with AQA. Actually, I think I'm making another revision video on how to answer 25 markers. But this is the final content one. As with all of the other policy videos, it's essentially a recap of what we did at GCSE, but then with some more extra information added. So it gives us our impact of this on a much wider scale and much more detail. So it's more of an in-depth analysis of the supply side policies and their usage and stuff. So what are supply side policies? Well, they're measures that are designed to increase aggregate supply, thus causing the long on aggregate supply curve to shift to the right, as shown on the diagram at the bottom. This means that there's been an increase in the potential output of the economy, so the economy is able to produce more without inflation. So you've got our increase in output, but we've actually got a fall in the price level. As you can see, we've had an extension of the aggregate demand curve, which means the price level has fallen. The axes aren't labelled for some reason, but you can see what I mean. Many improvements for supply side policies actually come from the private sector rather than the public sector. This is because firms have boosted their productivity to stay competitive in the rapidly growing market because there's so many firms in the market at the moment that firms simply have to keep the prices low to manage to survive and increasing productivity is a major way of reducing average costs and thus being able to maintain a low price. Now we're going to look at some examples of supply side policies. As you can see, they're in rainbow colours because I'm being sassy today. I've been doing rainbow colours in all of the policies. If you've watched the other videos, you might have noticed. I've been quite getting excited by my rainbow colours. It makes it a bit more livened up. Anyway, we're not here to talk about rainbows. We're here to talk about supply side policies. There's five on the screen. Labour market measures, tax reforms, reform of the welfare state, industrial and competition policy measures, and financial and capital market measures. Labour market measures essentially improving education and training. Obviously, that increases the productivity of workers because if they've got a high human capital, they can probably produce more in the same period of time and thus more productive. So that increases our ability to produce more in the same period of time. If we reduce the power of trade unions, this makes it harder for them to push for their workers to have a higher pay. Obviously, if firms are forced to pay their workers more, that means that they have to employ fewer people. So a few people get more money, but then there's loads of unemployed people and that's a wastage of resources. And we can never get back this wasted labour resource. Profit and performance related pay obviously has many benefits. It encourages people to work harder, be more productive. And if they're being more productive, it shifts the long and accurate supply curve to the right. However, it's really important to note performance related pay. Have you ever been to the shops and got these people desperate to sell you a pair of shoes? Like when you were a kid and you'd go in, they'd be like, these trainers are perfect for you, look at the little dolly in the bottom. But I don't think they spoke with those accents. I, literally, I can't do accents, so I've got no idea what accent that was. It wasn't a very good one either way. So the issue with performance related pay is that it is to pushy staff actually pushing customers off and this reducing demand. I mean, it's quite a very small level and within firms. It's more microeconomics here, but that is an issue with performance related pay. Tax reforms are very much about income tax. If we reduce income tax, it encourages people to work more, work longer hours, and thus increase total production within the economy. They may also work harder to try to get promotions where they can earn even more money, because if income tax is lower, it means that they won't have to give up so much of their income as they would have done before had they have had a promotion and got a higher pay. However, the government wants to ensure that it still gets the same amount of tax revenue, so that means replacing direct taxes with indirect taxes. As we know from videos from years and years ago, or a few days ago, weeks ago, direct taxes are progressive and indirect taxes are aggressive, which means if we do replace direct taxes with indirect taxes, this can be deemed to be inequitable because it has a harder hit on low income groups. However, if this hard hit on low income groups might actually encourage them to seek pay rises and seek promotions and thus be more productive within the workplace. A reform of the welfare state is actually a really important one for supply side policies. If we reduce state welfare benefits, that's an incentive for people who are voluntarily unemployed to choose employment over benefits and thus reduces the benefits trap or the poverty trap even, which is when people choose to stay on benefits rather than seek work because they can get more money on benefits. Obviously, reducing unemployment and having more people in employment leads to a lot of things. It leads to an increase in production, also an increase in aggregate demand if people have got more money. And increase in aggregate demand leads to a further rise in output, which is really good. 
industrial and competition policy measures. Privatisation, which is when you've got government-run stuff and you get it transferred to the private sector. So, for example, I always talk about Royal Mail for this. I'm still not sure whether Royal Mail is true or not. I suppose I could give you a question on that in the exam, probably unlikely in 2014 because it's only just happened. But if we did it, you know, next year, if anyone's watching this in 2015, 2016, and if they haven't written the papers yet, that could be something that comes up. Because, you know, the benefits and costs of transferring the Royal Mail to the private sector. If that's even what happened. Someone, please tell me whether that's what happened or not. If, you, if you're watching this, just comment and tell me, because it really puzzles me, and I'm just too lazy to look it up myself. Anyway, so yeah, if we transfer government-run stuff to the private sector, it tends to be much more effectively done, much more efficient, and the costs are lower, and productivity tends to rise within the company because the firm is desperate to be able to compete in the market. So it tends just to be better done, really. And finally, financial and capital market measures. So if you deregulate financial markets and try to promote greater competition among banks as a result, it encourages A, saving, and B, wider share ownership. Obviously, when you save with a bank, the bank then invests the money. If they invest the money in a particular firm, that firm's productivity tends to rise, thus shifting our long run supply curve. If people are buying more shares in companies, companies have more money to spend, so they can invest it in capital equipment, stuff like that, and thus increase productivity further. And really what the government is trying to do at the moment is promote entrepreneurship and encourage an enterprise culture. So it wants people to be more enterprising because that way the productivity level just tends to rise. If people are being ent entrepreneurial, still can't pronounce it, uh, entrepreneurial it means they're coming up with new capital equipment and stuff that might be more productive and thus that's really good because it allows firms to produce more in the same period of time, the economy to produce more in the same period of time, causing the long run aggregate supply curve to shift to the right. There are two major markets to consider when looking at supply side policies, the labour market and the product market. We're going to look at the labour market first. The labour market is essentially the factor market where labour is bought and sold. And the three main aims of the labour market supply side policies are to improve the quality and quantity of the labour supply, to improve the flexibility of the labour market and to increase the productive potential of the economy. Now we're going to look at labour market supply side policies themselves. Reducing the disincentives to work. There are two big ways of doing this and that's lowering the rate of income taxation and decreasing social security benefits. If we lower the rate of income tax it gives a short term demand boost to the economy and also improves incentives to work longer hours because it means that people will be able to earn more money in longer hours and they won't have to say they were like about to hit a boundary where they'd have to pay more at current income tax levels so once you reach such an amount you have to pay like 45 percent of your income or something like that say the government just removed that altogether and you didn't have to pay that massive increase people would like will work longer hours therefore they'd be contributing more to the economy there'd be a higher level of production within the economy important not to mix production with productivity working longer hours does not increase productivity it increases the level of production within the economy it also encourages people to seek a new job promotion and stuff like that so they can get more money decreasing social security benefits means that those that are on benefits have a reduced income therefore they think oh i don't really want to stay on benefits for a long time particularly voluntary unemployed people here. Therefore they are more likely to look for employment, particularly in a positive output gap when there is lots and lots of employment opportunities available for them. It reduces the risk of the unemployment trap which is when benefits are greater than the income they'd receive if they work. Moving on now to education and training, the government provision of training opportunities. For example this increases the productivity, the mobility and the flexibility of the workforce. Obviously, if people are more educated, they have a high human capital, they're more likely to be more productive, have greater skills in the workplace, stuff like that. And the mobility and flexibility of the workforce, if people have a wider range of skills through increased education, it means they're less likely to be occupationally immobile. So say there was a long-term decline in industry and the structural unemployment, these people would have the skills available to just switch industry and work in new industry instead. If you've got a higher productivity due to education and training, it increases the country's international competitiveness. So higher productivity means lower average costs, therefore we can compete on price in the international market. Obviously for the UK this isn't really very realistic, but for a lot of countries, you know, increasing the productivity will give them a massive boost in terms of international competitiveness. Trade union reforms. Trade unions are essentially large groups that have a number of members, so for teaching profession it's particularly a major thing. Lots of teachers are members of different 
trade unions, which and the trade unions essentially pushed them to get a better working conditions, higher pay, and stuff like that. Essentially, trade unions try to increase the wages of their members, but obviously, if you're paying workers more, you can only employ like fewer of them. So, trade unions actually lead to a fall in employment, which obviously reduces the efficiency and international competitiveness of the workforce. Therefore, a major labour market supply side policy is the reduction of the power of trade unions in order to discourage this effect from taking place. A final point that really isn't on here, but it's just come to my head anyway, to do with increasing the quantity of the labour supply. Encouraging immigration to come in, that increases the quantity of the labour supply. Also, you have countries like France, where they've got a low birth rate, they try to encourage uh, the people to have children, try to stimulate the economy, because that means in the future they're going to have a greater labour force. I think it's called Leco de Famille or something, but I'm not 100% sure on that because it's been a while since I studied it. Product markets. Product markets are markets in which all kinds of goods and services are traded. So basically anything you can buy or sell on the product market. So if you go on eBay, that's a product market. And it's like just a small, small, small section of the entire product market. I mean, I've got a sharpener in my hand. I always hold a sharpener and I'm filming for some reason. Sharpener in my hand, that's a product in the product market. I've got a phone, got a mouse, got this microphone I'm recording into. All products in the product market and obviously services, tourism is a big one, entertainment industry, that sort of thing. And the big aims of labour market supply side policies are to increase competition and efficiency in order to keep prices low essentially because if you've got increased competition and efficiency for lower prices which means you're more internationally competitive if we increase the productivity of industries again lower prices more internationally competitive also more efficient i suppose and if you know a combination of those two will shift the long run aggregate supply curve to the right which increases the capacity of the country to produce in the future we now have a sassy rainbow with all of the different product market supply side policies. The first one is privatisation, which is the sale of government owned assets to the private sector. So privately owned enterprises are more efficient and competitive than publicly owned ones. Because if the government's controlling it, it tends to be more inefficient because there's less competition. The government aren't experts in running businesses. So if they can sell it to people that are experts in running businesses, they tend to be able to do it more efficiently because they're used to having to work very hard to compete. It also means that these different like business not businesses, I suppose the assets and stuff, have exposure to the discipline of the market, which means that they get exposed to the harsh reality, you know, massive competition and stuff like that, which leads to a massive right shift of the aggregate supply curve as they have to try to stay competitive through cutting costs. Deregulation is the removal of government control and barriers to entry from markets, which basically means that before we had public sector monopolies, we've now got more competitive markets. Obviously, more competitive markets tend to have lower prices because you know they're all competing and they need to compete on quality, so higher quality, and on price, so lower prices, which is much better for the economy and, well, in terms of people being able to afford stuff. And in order to keep prices low, you have to be more efficient, so it's an incentive for firms to be efficient, and if we're efficiently using our uh, very scarce resources, it's better for the economy, it means you have to give up less to create each product. Stuff like that. Toughening of the competition policy. Essentially, the government wants to increase competition, so firms are forced to be more efficient in order to use scarce resources. This leads to reduced costs, more efficient is lower costs, and thus we have lower prices. This reduces the risk of the market failure that occurs due to monopoly power. If you want to learn more about that, go and watch a video on it. Uh, go watch, I think it's the market failure video for microeconomics. But obviously, we're dwindling into microeconomic stuff here, and we don't really want to be doing that. We then have commitment to free international trade. If we try to expand free trade in the EU and the world, I suppose, mass globalisation, that leads to increased competition, and that's an even greater incentive to be efficient, so it lowers prices for consumers, because firms are trying so hard to keep their prices low to be able to compete on an international scale. However, this could essentially lead to the UK market being flooded with imports, which would lead to a left shift of the aggregate demand curve, which would lead to higher prices in the UK. We'd be flooded with imports because, simply put, countries with no minimum wage can compete so much easier than us on price and stuff. And it just forces UK for, oh dear, a bird just hit the window. First is, oh no, I think it sh made a mess in the window. Oh. Sorry, um, <laughs> it forces UK firms to be competitive. I think I'll check if a dead bird's okay. Well, it's dead, it probably isn't okay. Sorry, I keep getting distracted here. Um, yes, if we have uh, lots of cheap imports because they haven't got any 
like restrictions such as a minimum wage and rules on pollution and stuff, it means that UK firms might actually be forced out of the market rather than into it and that would lead to a left shift of the short run aggregate supply curve, which isn't really so good. And finally, entrepreneurship and, I still can't pronounce that, and capital spending. If we try to encourage entrepreneurship and investment, that means that obviously investment leads to a rightward shift of the long run aggregate supply curve anyway, but it also increases the rate of new business startups through loans. So say we try to encourage banks to give out loans, for example, I suppose you could use certain monetary policy measures to try to increase the money supply within the economy. If we have more businesses starting up, that leads to a right shift in the short run aggregate supply curve. We have the provision of regional policy assistance, so essentially, and advice for new firms. So basically, it all helps new firms try to be able to enter the market. If we've got more firms in the market, not only does this increase the competition, causing prices hopefully to fall further and efficiency to rise, but it also leads to a big right shift of the short run aggregate supply curve. For those of you who are concerned about the dead bird, and I can in some way would be because I went back to listen to that and you can actually hear the bird hitting the window, I just went to check and there is no sign of a dead bird anywhere, so hopefully it's alright. We're going to now move on to the supply side policy with the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model in mind. The desired effect of the supply side policies are to shift the long and aggregate supply curve to the right, whilst increasing the trend rate of growth and hopefully increasing potential GDP, so we're essentially trying to get economic growth and an increased capacity to produce. But as you can see on this diagram, there must be a substantial increase in aggregate demand for supply side policies to actually be effective, because a long aggregate supply curve shift without aggregate demand shifting as well only leads to a small increase in output of Inc. 1, whereas if we have an AD shift as well, the size of the increase in real output is actually much, much bigger. If you look at Inc. 2, it's quite a lot bigger than Inc. 1. I think this is quite a good point to make in essays, I always make it in essays if I can slip it in. Draw out the diagram, it looks nice, it looks like you thought about it, and it's also making an analytical point, it's trying to, because you've got to get a balanced essay and you've got to say, you know, if you're saying, using, talking about different policies, you've got to say, you know, why they might not work, and this might be a point you might want to make, you might want to say the effectiveness of the policy is lower if there's no aggregate demand, change in aggregate demand. I mean, especially if we had it even further left, the aggregate demand was much further left. If you look at it and you imagine drawing it on, there'd be like almost no increase in real output. So you'd have this massive shift in long aggregate supply and no real increase in output, which would be a bit of a waste of time. It's also important to note that supply side policies are notorious for not working. So you have to wait a long time anyway. Like, for example, education and training won't fully take impact for like 18 years until after you've implemented it. They're very expensive due to a budget deficit don't usually work. So if you look at evidence from the past, a lot of money is injected into these schemes and they're not always very effective and that's why there's been such this big uproar about the HS2 railway being spent, so much money is being spent on it, it's plunging the government into budget deficit. You can write about opportunity cost here, what's being given up in order to try to get the like HS2 railway running and stuff like that. There are obviously a lot of flaws with the supply side policies. And as you can probably tell by my less than excited tone in this video in comparison to the monetary and fiscal policy videos, I'm not a massive fan of them. And we're going to look at another diagram you could use to illustrate the effect of the supply side policies. Essentially, we've got our production possibility boundary, and if we have an increase in labour and productivity and capital and stuff like that, that leads to an increased productive efficiency and an increased capacity to produce, hence the production possibility curve has shifted outwards. As you can see, so there's a massive increase in the actual capacity of the economy to produce. And you've got to take note here, just because the capacity of the economy to produce has increased, it doesn't mean the actual supply in the economy has increased. So you might have shifted outwards, and that's all great, but your cross indicating how much you're actually producing might still be inside the curve. I mean, at the moment, we are struggling to get actually onto the curve itself, let alone shifting the curve outwards. Woo! We've reached the end of the macroeconomics course, which means it's the whole economics is now done, except I think I'm making a video on answering 25 markers, because quite a few people asked me to do that. So that one will be soon. I'd just like to say thank you to anyone that's watched, and also to my economics teachers who have helped me a lot throughout the year with my economical understanding and stuff like that. Hopefully you've all enjoyed watching these, or even if you haven't enjoyed watching my random ramblings on, hopefully it's helped you a small amount, and you know, just best of luck in the exam, hope it all goes really well for you. 
Have a lovely day and bye-bye.